Well, hello, Copenhagen. Uh, and it's an honor for me to speak with you today. I, I am very sorry that I can't be there in person. I've been called away to Facebook, where I've just recently started as a content strategist. That's a new adventure for me. Before this, I was in UX design, and before that, I was in information architecture. And as you know, those communities, well, we hear the same complaints over and over, don't we? Why doesn't anybody take us seriously? Why can't I get a seat at the table? Time and again, I hear people hired into a UX job and then obstructed from doing it effectively or having to compete every day to do a job that they've already won. In an age where software is eating the world, it can sometimes seem like anyone who isn't a software engineer is like a UN goodwill ambassador but kind, of, kind of nice to have, but ultimately only for show. What UX and IA and content strategy all have in common is systems thinking. We think about the high level structure and interoperability of visual language and semantic language and, well, language. And agile development has sometimes made that difficult. Responding to change over following a plan, so the manifesto says. Reducing the craft of experience design to the execution of haphazard UI elements. Designers trying desperately to keep up with the development process seemingly all about diving in head first. It could all lead to a lot of squabbling. UX leads and product managers really both thinking that they're in charge of product definition. Lack of alignment between production and marketing and customer services. Even the product itself, drifting hopelessly off course, sinking slowly under the weight of its own feature bloat. When you don't know what you believe, then everything's an argument. So says Jason Freed of 37 Signals, or now Basecamp. Well, that guy's kind of a douche, but on this point, he's absolutely right. You need to know what you believe. You need a North Star, something to follow, to keep everybody aligned. Now, funnily enough, the process of finding that has been around forever, but it's been dismissed by some uh, as merely marketing. Today, I want to talk to you about brand. Now, I don't mean your logo or your Pantone colors or your typography choices or anything like that. No, I want to think about what brand really means and how it can be used to bridge the worlds of UX and IA and content strategy and indeed align entire organizations and product roadmaps. Once upon a time, there was a startup a late entrant challenger into a mature market. Maybe it was CMS software. Maybe it was a smartphone. Maybe it was a B2B collaboration tool. It really doesn't matter. That mature market had its market leader, well adopted and difficult to dethrone, and utterly hated by its users. Overloaded with features and complexity, making the entire experience of using it frustrating and painful. The startup spotted an opportunity. They could strip the entire experience back to the core, make something clean and simple, put a lot of UX on the top, do the same job as the market leader, but better. So they threw together a prototype and that got them some venture capital and they were off and running and customers, well, they were delighted at this clean and stripped down and new improved experience. Except, well, there was just that one feature that the old thing could do that they really liked. Could this new product do it too? And hey, wouldn't it be cool if it did these other five things as well? Well, the startup was high on customer love. They were a hit and so customer centric in their being that they were only too happy to implement all of the new features. It would make the product better after all. Everything was happy for a while. The product matured and it responded to customer needs 
and the customer started to think, hey, I actually use these five products to do my work. This new thing is so well designed that maybe if these guys could include all the features of my other products, I could basically just use their one product. Everyone loves a one-stop shop, right? Take two bottles into the shower? Not me. Oh, best beloved, you know where this story is going. The product grew bigger and bigger. The startup got so used to responding to customer requests that it lost sight of what it was trying to be. And just like that other story about the blind man feeling out the elephant, each customer thought of the product in their own way. It's a floor wax and a dessert topping. For those of you who recognize references from 1978. So it was really no surprise when the different customer groups started to ask for everything from instant messaging to document creation to video editing and maybe a chatbot because they're cool now. The product had put on weight. It was heavy. It had taken on the face of several different products, spread into different product categories, and yet somehow winning in none of them. The product manager made a tough call. She would look hard at the features that weren't used much anymore and move to close them down. They would get the product back to a manageable core. She told the customer success team who told the customers that in the next release, some things would be going away. But it turned out that not all customers were created equal. One customer was an oil company who really liked that mostly useless feature. The oil company accounted for about 20% of the startup's monthly revenue. The oil company threatened to pull their account unless the product stayed exactly as it was. After all, they had designed their entire workflow around the way that the product currently worked. Oh, and by the way, they had a few ideas for extra features which they said they would be very, very helpful in getting them to gain adoption. The startup was stuck. Was it in the product business? Was it in the client services business? Instead of building a tribe of raving fans, it had accumulated a diverse and contradictory collection of customer needs. It was stuck in a cycle of short-term customer appeasement just to keep the customers that it had. Pleasing one customer would infuriate another. To say nothing of the technical debt it had accrued, making even the simplest changes difficult and expensive. New customers were hard to come by since the days of the clean and simple and focused products were long behind them now. In the end, it didn't matter because somewhere in the world, two people looked at this bloated and unfocused product and thought they could do something better. They started a new product, stripping the experience back to the core. Well, perhaps that story is familiar. One of the hardest things to do in business, particularly a product business, is to say no, especially to customers. By the time you're trapped in that short term of uh, that short term cycle of tactical appeasement, just trying to keep your existing customers, you're strangling your chances of growth. I think a better approach is to build a tribe, make it clear what you believe. Communicate the story of why you do what you do and attract, well, the right kind of customers, the customers who support your objectives and who want to be like you. Brand is an idea that you stand for, made real by the things that you do. Brand isn't random acts of marketing. A brand is a small idea that occupies a corner of our mind. It's a promise to your customer about what to expect from your products and services. It starts in the gut. We're emotional creatures after all. And if enough people have the same gut feeling, we can call that a brand. And it goes beyond all kinds of rationality. This stuff is really primal. 
If you've ever lusted after a Ford Mustang or a pair of Jimmy Choo's, you understand that brand allegiance isn't always about practical benefits. Now, it's not all touchy-feely, of course. It drives the economic growth of your business. Consider the humble coffee bean, a commodity if ever there was one. But grind them into a cup of coffee and you've got a product to sell. Sell it in a coffee shop? Well, you're offering a service. Put some comfy chairs and some smooth jazz in that coffee shop and you're creating an experience. Make that experience part of our everyday lives and you've driven behavioral transformation. Building preference and long-term loyalty. As Peter Drucker once said, create the customer and the money will follow. And Simon Sinek says in his now world-famous TED Talk that the most compelling brands of our age, the Apples or the Nikes of the world, have found success in defining and communicating their core beliefs. Their message doesn't start from what they do or how they do it, but why they do what they do. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Shared values and a shared mission align everybody on a team. There's a great story about President Kennedy visiting the NASA building back in the, I guess, the early 60s. And he walks up to a, a janitor and he says, so, uh, so what do you do? And the janitor stands up straight and he puts down his mop and he says, Mr. President, I'm helping put a man on the moon. Can your business look beyond the next quarter and understand ultimately what it's trying to achieve? Now, I don't mean profit or shareholder value or being a market leader, but what are those things a result of? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? We all work best when we feel the most rewarded and sure, the money helps, but true reward comes from, fe comes from feeling that what we do has value. If we have a mission, we can come together and we can mount our own moonshot. And if that mission is compelling to customers, well, they'll be rooting to help us get there. In the 1970s, Microsoft had a fantastic mission to put a computer on every desk and in every home. And whatever your feelings about working with Excel today, my goodness, they did do that. So ask yourself, what are we for? And how will we know when we're done? Hand in hand with core purpose are core values. The qualities and the virtues authentically shared by everybody in the organization and lived every day. For better or worse, our values are not a picture of who we want to be. They are a reflection of who we really are. Every organization is made of individuals, so it stands to reason that the collective values of the company are the shared values of its people. Now, if our values and our purpose drive the things that we say, well, then our personality is how we say it. Are we a little bit cheeky or are we buttoned up and formal? Do we speak like a peer or like a parent? Well, personality is a great driver in creating memorable and engaging experiences, both in the content that we serve up and indeed in the interfaces that we design for getting it. Now, of course, if you've ever been in on meetings about brand personality, at least in the UK, you could probably set your watch by the time that Innocent Drinks comes into the conversation. As a brand, Innocent values their all-natural, no-nasties range of smoothies and drinks products, and indeed the transparency of their culture. In fact, they call themselves Innocent as a kind of insurance policy, knowing that they'd be pilloried by the public if they were ever caught doing anything guilty. But what really caught on with the people, the public, was the funny, irreverent tone that they put into their packaging. It really played to the idea of innocent being different and non-corporate and, well, innocent. But their success led to many others trying this informal, over-friendly voice. And when everyone's doing it, well, it all gets a bit too much. It got a name, Wackaging, short for Wacky Packaging. 
and it started appearing everywhere, co-opted by banks and utilities and other companies far from innocent in any sense. Do we really want the bill from our water company speaking to us in an overly chatty tone before we've even opened the envelope? Well, as with everything else, our brand personality has to come from the bottom up. What are we really like? What can we sustain? Brand personality isn't how we behave on a first date, it's how we behave in a marriage. It too needs to be authentic stemming from our values and from our mission, relevant to our sector and to our audience, and above all, unique, instantly identifiable with our brand and with nobody else. Now, it used to be that personality for products came from the way that they were advertised. When the VW Beetle first launched in the US, no one really quite knew what to make of this funny-looking doodlebug thing from then very recently post-war Germany. One could argue that the personality that we now ascribe to the Beatle stemmed from these iconic long copy ads that expressed Volkswagen's straightforward and playful and self-deprecating tone. By contrast, this legendary ad from David Ogilvy was born in the pages of an engineering report stating that at 60 miles an hour, the loudest sounds from inside the Rolls Royce come from the ticking of the electric clock. An elegant and authentically true idea expressed with a quiet confidence and charm which exudes the Rolls-Royce personality. Now, often with the digital products that we create, the product itself is the primary, perhaps the only way for customers to engage with the brand. To create our tribe, we have to infuse the product directly with our vision, our values and our voice. The idea that we stand for made real by what we do. Through our content strategy, we can devise micro and macro ways to communicate our personality and build a fan base. The way that we write our microcopy expresses our voice and our tone, both in happy times and when we want to support our customer in sensitive times, when we want to convey empathy for difficult situations. As we learn from the wackaging, personality doesn't come necessarily from speaking like the user's best friend, but it does, mean, it does mean aligning to shared principles. At Facebook, we say that content is communication, that content is design, that content builds trust with our audience. So our voice principles support that. Keep it simple. We use concise, plain language. Get to the point. We explain things clearly and give enough information to help me put people make informed decisions. And talk like a person. We're friendly and we're conversational and we're respectful. But we're never silly or wacky or cheeky. And that's just the in-product experience. A lot of digital brands are using content to support their customers' wider objectives. Look at Airbnb with their city guides and their wanderlust magazine content. Or MailChimp with their booklets on email marketing. Or gather content with their guides and webinars on how to be a better content strategist. In all cases, this content isn't pushing the core product, but it's providing useful and usable content about the surrounding subject domain. Nobody cares what your product can do. They only care what it can do for them. So build a tribe by showing your customers that you care about the things that they care about too. Even information architecture can communicate your proposition and your beliefs. And that's perhaps not surprising since IA really underpins everything that you present to your users. It is the design behind the design. And classification isn't neutral. The terms that you use and the taxonomy through which you arrange them conveys an awful lot about what you believe and what you consider to be important. Once I worked on a product that was all about collaboration within enterprise companies, it was intended to break down silos and organizational structures and get everybody working better together, which was a fine and noble thing to do. 
except the structure of their IA arranged every person into a rigid, rigid hierarchical team. One person, one team, under one department. A hierarchy may be even more strict than the reality that it was supposedly modeling. But changing the IA changed the product. From a hierarchy to a graph. Rich entity relationships made everything deeply intertwingled. Suddenly anyone can be one in one or many teams, even one or many companies. Document permissions are now based on who wants to see them, not where they live in the filing cabinet. This information architecture better supported the core mission of the product. Well, creating that distinctiveness in a product is vital to building a tribe, because rarely, if ever, are you creating something entirely new. You're reacting to a kind of frustration in an existing product or an existing market sector. You're a challenger, disrupting the status quo, making people think about a product category in a new way and turning any, any weaknesses that you might have into strengths. Successfully challenging means taking a different road, zagging where others zig. And while our reliance on, on patterns in experience design has its strengths, well, we sure could use more differentiation, both in our product propositions and in the design execution of them. Design is moving in trends and designers are now seem to seem to be riffing on one another. But design and brand personality can be more than aesthetic tropes. They can underscore your values, your differentiator, and really talk about how you're disrupting the status quo. Twitter wasn't the first blogging platform, but it popularized a whole new category of microblogging. That 140 character limit, long may it rain, makes the differentiator clear. It's the thing that makes Twitter Twitter. Instagram deliberately restricts you from adding uh, photos by your computer. You have to do it all on your phone because their point of difference is the instant experience. When I worked for that B2B tool, it was called Huddle, and we uh, uncovered intelligence as our differentiator, the intelligence of the individual user, the aggregate business intelligence, and our own smart algorithms that could serve up appropriately intelligent content. So rather than being a Me Too collaboration tool, we could be the first intelligent collaboration tool, focusing the experience around personalized content, and in doing so, making our competitors seem like mere file storage. This is brand-driven design. Crafting an experience with your differentiated values at the heart of the product design. The first law of branding is focus. Staying true to that one idea. And focus means doing less. Fewer features, less content. The more we add, the more we blur the clarity of that simple proposition that we need people to remember. Brand is made of mission and values and personality, the things that we care about, made real by what we do. Virtue untested is no virtue at all. So saying no is hard. But staying true to a mission is hard. But it yields better products, better customers, and better people in the organization. Businesses are made of people. Successful brands aren't defined from the top down, but from the bottom up. The motivations of each individual shape the culture of the organism. And in that sense, you are not your job. Your job is being you. With a clear mission and a set of principles that everybody aligns to, well, individuals can be trusted and empowered to do the right thing. I've experienced that firsthand at Facebook. Getting hired at Facebook is difficult. They look for very experienced people and they put them through quite a tough recruitment process. But getting the job means that they trust you, empower you to do the right thing and create impact. They tell you the mission to make the world more open and connected. 
And if you find things that need fixing, well, go fix them. As they tell you, nothing at Facebook is somebody else's problem. We're not the only ones. New employees to uh, Nordstrom, the department store in the US, well, they're given the company handbook when they first join. I say handbook, it's actually just a card that reads, use your best judgment in all situations. The point is that trust and the empowerment of indiv individuals are the hallmarks of successful teams, guided by a shared mission and a shared set of values. When you don't know what you believe in, everything's an argument. When you do know, then even if you debate the details, you're at least aligned on the principles. Agree the strategy and argue the tactics. Brand is the reflection of who you truly are. If the reality of your company is better than your image, we'll fix the brand message. But if you want an image more positive than your reality, we'll fix the company. What you offer defines your brand. It shows people what, you're, what you care about and it acknowledges what you're good at. How you design your products defines your brand. The choreography of content across channels, the specific emphases and restrictions that you impose to govern behavior or control the conversation or draw lines in the sand. Where Android expresses humility by giving users ultimate customization, iOS offers the firm hand of consistent design. Brands can be justifiably arrogant or humble, and neither one is bad. You can be the Beatles or you can be the Stones, but you just can't be both. More than anything, how you treat people defines your brand. We have choice. We demand authentic relationships, and in a world of too much stuff, we want distinctiveness. Give people something they can't get from the next click away. The things that you value should drive the things that you do and shape the work that we all put into the world. It builds a relationship, that loyalty, that love that customers could have for your product and your brand. Wouldn't we all want, want to come to work every day with a shared sense of purpose? Like information architecture, like user experience, like content, brand is always there. The only question is how much care and attention you're going to give it. Brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. What will it take to be remembered? What will it take for them to say something nice? Thank you very much for your time.